large contemporary home will be built on this foundation. An architect has designed the house and developed plans that make it possible to visualize the house before it is built, from the overall structure down to specific details. A building contractor will coordinate the work of all the different tradesmen necessary to complete the home. The carpentry crew will use the plans and their skill and knowledge in building the basic structure of the house. Construction techniques and terminology vary in different parts of the country and even from one crew to another. By showing the construction of this unusual house, the basic parts and structure of a wood frame shell will be illustrated. The shell is the skeleton or frame of the house and the materials that cover the outside of the frame. A sill serves as the base for the house frame, providing a wooden surface into which nails can be driven. A compressible sill sealer placed under the sill helps keep drafts out of the basement. The sill is secured by anchor bolts previously set in the foundation walls. Girders, also called beams, help support the floor frame. Girders can be made of wood or steel. The girders are supported by foundation walls and steel pipe columns. Two by eight framing lumber is used for the floor frame. The floor joists will be nailed to this long two by eight that will be used as a joist header. The end joist and header rest on and are nailed to the sill. Together, they form the outside edge of the floor frame. The position of each floor joist is marked on the joist header. The joists are spaced 16 inches apart. Three large 16 or 20 penny common nails are driven through the joist header into each joist. The joists run perpendicular to the joist header. The floor frame rests on top of the sill and supporting girders. The size and spacing of all framing lumber is specified by the architect in the plans. The size of floor joists depends on the distance they have to span and on the spacing between them. The closer the spacing, the stronger the floor. Girders reduce the distance the joists have to span. Rigid metal decking over the garage and entryway will be covered later with a concrete slab. Metal joist hangers can be used to connect floor joists to a girder, bringing the tops of the joists to the same height as the top of the girder. Cross bridging ties the joists together and spreads the load. 
This increases the strength and reduces the bounce of the floor frame. Cross bridging is nailed at the top only for now. The bottoms will be nailed later, after the initial settling of the house frame has occurred. Stairs made of framing lumber provide safe access between the basement and first floor. Plywood is used for the subfloor, the first material covering the floor frame. Plywood measures 4 by 8 feet and comes in different grades and thicknesses. Before the introduction of plywood, tongue and groove boards were used for the subfloor. The subfloor, nailed to the floor frame, forms the first floor deck. For greatest strength, the long edge of the plywood is placed perpendicular to the floor joists, and the rows, called courses, are staggered. The joists, spaced 16 inches apart, accommodate the 8-foot length of the plywood. 12 or 24 inch spacing would also allow the end of the plywood to land directly over a joist. Excess subflooring is trimmed off. A deck must be straight, level, and have precise angles at the corners. An inaccurate deck will cause extra work later in construction. The deck is completely nailed down with either six or eight penny common nails, depending on the thickness of the plywood. The masons, shown in another film, The Foundation, return briefly to pour a reinforced concrete slab that will serve as an outdoor deck as well as the garage roof. Wall framing methods vary, but the parts of a 2x4 stud wall are generally the same. The carpenter cuts the walls upper and lower horizontal 2x4s, called the top and bottom plates. Vertical 2x4s, the studs, will be nailed between the plates. The placement of the studs is marked on the plates. Studs are also spaced 16 inches on center, which means that the centers of the studs are spaced 16 inches apart. The fact that the studs are spaced so regularly means that the wall will support weight uniformly along its entire length. Lines show where the edges of the studs go. X's indicate which side of the line. Making sure that the ends of the plates are even, the X's and lines are transferred to the other plate. out and assembled on the deck. The studs must be exactly the same length. many variations in wall framing. Here, two 16-penny common nails are face nailed through the plates into each stud. The studs can also be toe-nailed.
The plans indicate that this wall is to have a window, and since the wall is designed to carry weight along its entire length, the rough opening for the window must not be a weakness in the structure. Two by four header jacks installed on both sides of the opening support the header that goes over all window and door openings. Short cripple studs bring the header in contact with the top plate. The various parts of the rough opening work together to transfer weight around the opening down to the deck. Sill jacks support the rough sill on which the window unit is placed. The rough opening is made larger than the actual window dimensions to permit easy installation and accurate adjustment. Each wall unit is put together on the floor, then raised. Some walls are built thicker for extra sound insulation. They have staggered studs and two by six plates. Exterior walls carry the weight of the roof and additional stories. Interior walls are called partitions. If they support weight, they're called bearing partitions. Bearing partitions are supported directly below by basement walls or girders. Throughout framing, walls are checked with a level to be sure they are plumb, meaning exactly vertical. Temporary diagonal bracing keeps the walls from shifting side to side. Additional bracing keeps the walls from moving in or out. It's necessary to check frequently to be sure the walls remain plumb. An additional top plate helps tie the different wall sections together and provides a strong resting surface for the rest of the house frame. When a house is designed to have more than one story, another floor deck is built on top of the walls. Since this section of the house will be only one story, these joists will support the attic floor and serve as a nailing surface for the first floor ceiling. The joists are supported by bearing partitions and exterior walls, and sometimes by ceiling girders. Nailed to girders and the top of the walls, the joists help tie the house frame together. smoothly together, carpenters can increase the output of their work. A good worker anticipates the next step to avoid interrupting the momentum of the job. He has to be able to work efficiently with others as well as alone.
These short walls are for a small, unusual second story room called the crow's nest. Crow's Nest will have custom windows and its own separate roof. Rafters frame and support the roof. The plan specify the steepness of the roof pitch, which determines the angle at which rafters are cut. These common rafters are nailed on both sides of a ridge and to the wall top plate. Until enough rafters are installed to support the ridge, a temporary brace holds it up. The ridge provides a surface to connect and space common rafters. There are different types of rafters and different style roofs. This house has a hip roof, which besides common rafters, also has hip rafters. Hip rafters run down to a corner formed by two exterior walls. This long hip rafter is three two by twelves nailed and glued together. The lower ends of the rafters are notched and nailed to the wall top plate. These rafters run to the top of the crow's nest walls, where they are also notched and nailed. Usually, rafters in any section of a roof are evenly spaced and parallel. An angled beveled cut is made on a hip jack rafter. Hip jack rafters, always installed on both sides of a hip rafter, are another type of rafter used in a hip roof. The long rafter overhangs will shade the windows below in the summer and let the sun shine through in the winter when the afternoon sun is lower in the sky. This wood frame chimney will contain insulated metal flue pipes serving three fireplaces, the furnace and hot water heater. The framing is now complete. Plywood, or any material used to cover the frame, is called sheathing. Wall sheathing can be put on any time after a wall is built. Some crews even sheathe the walls before they tip them up. The 16-inch spacing of the studs allows both ends of the 8-foot plywood to land directly over a stud. The plywood is nailed along each stud with six or eight penny nails, again, depending on the thickness of the plywood. The even spacing also provides a convenient nailing surface for four by eight modular interior wall coverings, such as wallboard or paneling. Because of the plywood strength and rigidity, 
the diagonal wall bracing can be removed after the sheathing is completely nailed off. Small window openings can be sheathed over, then cut out. A reciprocating saw makes this task neat, safe, and efficient. Plywood sheathing is also used on the roof. The long side of the plywood is kept parallel to the outside edge of the roof and perpendicular to the rafters. The seams of two sheets must meet directly over the middle of a rafter. Instead of always using full sheets, a sheet cut in half is used at the start of every other course. This staggering assures that no vertical seam falls directly in line with one on a lower course, giving the roof structure interconnected strength. Difficult roof sections are tacked down to be sure they line up correctly. Then, each section is completely nailed off. basic procedure is used for sheathing each section of the roof. While the top and bottom ends of a rafter might be in the correct position, the middle may be off due to bows or curves in the wood. Marking the rafter spacing on each course of plywood enables the carpenters to keep the rafters straight as they work their way up the roof. Chalk line marks the plywood for the last course. Alertness and a tight grip are essential for safe operation of a circular saw. A craftsman uses balance and control, not just strength, to move heavy materials. Steady, controlled movement is the key to efficiency and safety. chimney is also sheathed with plywood. Asphalt saturated paper called building felt covers the roof sheathing. overlap with lower ones put on first to provide proper water drainage. A staple hammer is an easy efficient tool for securing the building belt. On this house, the walls are completely covered with building felt to provide extra protection. 
Usually, narrow strips around windows, doors, and corners provide sufficient protection from water penetration. Once the house is protected from rain, plumbing, electricity, and other interior work can begin. Pre-made window units are installed into the rough openings. Diagonal bracing helps keep the window's corners at 90 degrees. The unit must be straight, plumb, and level. Nails are driven through the window casing into the framing lumber. Roofs can be covered with any of a number of different materials. This house is roofed with a type of asphalt shingle. For extra protection, roll roofing borders the edge of the roof. Shingles are put on from the bottom course up with roofing nails that have large heads to hold the shingles down. The shingle courses are staggered to prevent water penetration at the seams. Roofs are measured in 100 square foot sections called squares. This roof is 4,500 square feet or 45 square. That's 180 bundles of these shingles weighing over seven tons. Whatever type of siding is used, caulking behind it around windows and also doors and corners provides additional water protection. The siding used here is cedar clapboard, also called bevel siding. The wood is clear, free of knots or knot holes that might cause a leak. Eight penny casing head nails made of aluminum are used to prevent rust stains from bleeding onto the siding. The covering on the underside of a roof overhang is called a soffit. Later, vents will be cut into the soffit, allowing air to circulate under the roof, preventing moisture condensation that could cause the wood to rot. The crow's nest is finished when the custom windows finally arrive and are installed. The wood shell of this unusual house is now complete, but a lot more work remains to be done on the interior before this house becomes a home. <laughs>